Dustin is going to be passing out extra copies of tonight's lesson if anybody's in need of one. And if you want to be taking your Old Testaments and be opening up to 2 Samuel chapter 2. 2 Samuel chapter 2. Nobody else? All right. Let's begin our class with a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for another day for the life that you have blessed us with. We thank you so much for the beautiful weather that we've had this week and just a reminder that you are the creator of all things. We pray, dear Lord, that we live every waking moment of our lives in a recognition of you as the most holy God of heaven and of earth and that we give you our very best every day in, in service and in, in, dear Lord, wherever we may have fallen short, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins. Dear Lord, it is through Your Son and His perfect life and through His death, burial, and resurrection that we have this opportunity. And indeed, He is our greatest blessing, our greatest gift given to, you, or given to us by You. We just pray that we are a wise steward of every spiritual and physical blessing, dear Lord. May we always do such and, and live our lives in such a manner that we will be found righteous and blameless before You. Our Heavenly Father, as we open up Your Word again this evening and study another portion of David's life and as he begins to reign as king over Israel, we just pray that we will be attentive to the lessons that we can apply straight from his life and into our lives and that we will make those applications sure and steadfast. We pray, dear Lord, that you will be with those that are sick, be with those that are dealing with ongoing cancers, be with those that are traveling. Our Heavenly Father, please be with those that have experienced loss in their lives. We thank you. We love you. And we're so thankful that you first loved us. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to open up to 2 Samuel chapter 2, but I, I've turned back in my Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 2 because it's there in 1 Samuel chapter 2, you'll remember with me that Hannah sings that song of praise to God. And one of the things that she prays for in her song is that the Lord is going to exalt the humble and He is going to abase the prideful. And that's exactly what we've seen so far in the reign of Saul, specifically. We saw how, at the beginning, his, his attitude and, and his hum, humility. When, when Samuel comes to Saul, remember Saul says, you know, who am I? I am of the least of the tribes of the least of the families. But by the end of Saul's reign, we saw his great downfall and the pride that led to that downfall. But still yet, last, Sunday, or last Wednesday night, we ended in 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel chapter 1, and there we saw died. He's died. Saul has died. David laments this. He cries out for Saul. But now the way is prepared for David to come to power. Now it is, the way is starting to clear its path so that David can now become king over Israel. So tonight we have before us 2 Samuel chapter 2 through chapter 7. There's a lot of things to discuss. There's a lot of things that we're going to be dealing with specifically in chapters 6 and 7. But prior to getting there, I think we're going to, in our outline, that first question, we're going to look at some things that are important in these early chapters of 2 Samuel. Once again, we're looking at a new map tonight. We've looked at various maps. We've been looking at the map of Israel in the period of the Judges. We looked at the map of the Israel during the period of Saul's reign come to the reign of David. And this is essentially where Israel and the people lived. But this green area is going to be where David ultimately is going to uh, conquer and, and gain land for the Israelite nation. And then ultimately in Solomon's reign, so we're going to come to that map in just a little while, uh, Solomon is going to reign all the way up to the Euphrates River in the far north. Now, at first, as we're going to look at in chapters 2 and 3, the nation is not yet united as David being their king just yet. That, doesn't that does not occur until uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. 
And until that point, what we have is Ishbosheth is the king of the north and of Israel, and Mahananam is his capital. And then David is going to reign from Hebron for approximately seven and a half years. And then we're going to talk about David moving to Jabus or to Jerusalem this evening also. So we see all of these things. So let's look at that first question, outlining the early years of David's reign and move to Jerusalem. What's one of the first things that, that sticks out to you in those early chapters, chapters 2 and 3? All right, he's going to conquer Jerusalem. And we're going to look at another map that's going to help us understand a little bit of how that came about. So Jerusalem isn't the city of David yet. It's still, it is owned by the Canaanites. This is an area, this is a city that still had not been conquered, even going back all the way to the period of the conquest of the land. So this is something that David is going to fulfill there in these chapters. What's something else that occurs in these chapters? All right, so that's a very important thing. Let's look at that real quick. In chapter 3, you remember with me Abner, who had taken Ishbosheth and had Ishbosheth anointed or, or placed as king because he was the, the son of Saul and he was the rightful king. Well, Abner and Ishbosheth have a, a divide. And Ishbosheth had taken one of the Saul's concubines and and Ishbosheth says, why did you do this? And Abner essentially just said, look, why are you treating me like a dog? I was the commander of the army for your, for your father, and now I'm essentially, I'm doing everything for you now, so I'm leaving. So Abner comes to David ultimately in Hebrew, and he tells David, he says, I'm going to come to your side. But what does David request of Abner? Look at verse 13 of chapter 3. Someone read that. Good. I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, you shall not say to Mikael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. All right. So Abner says, I'm going to transfer sides. I'm going to leave Ishbosheth and Israel, and I'm going to come to you. But in doing such, David says, well, before you come, I'm not going to see your face unless you bring Michael. And how does David call, what does he say to you? He calls her Saul's daughter. Was Michael his wife? Yes. Other, other than that, that Saul had taken her from David at the end of chapter 25. But still, that, that's David's wife. So there's, there's some things that's happening here. But why does David call for Michael? Why do y'all think he calls for Michael here from Adam? All right. Well, he, he said, I, I paid for it. I gave the, the foreskins of the Philistines. I paid the dowry. Absolutely. So the household of David's growing stronger. The household of Saul is going down. But remember, come back to this slide with me. Who's up here? Benjamin, Ephraim, and all the tribes, right? The only house that went with David was the tribe of Judah. So David is calling for Michael because Michael is whose daughter? And where are all Saul's people? <clears throat> David's using this as a political ploy. He's calling her back to him because he needs her so that he can reunite the country, so that he can be the king over all of Israel. Well, Joab hears that David's had some conversations with Abner, and Joab does what? He kills him. Why does Joab kill Abner? Because Abner had killed Asahel. So this is Joab, and he, you know, David hadn't went after him back then. 
Joab's kind of held this back, and now Joab's going to take his opportunity. And it seems when you read at the end of chapter three, Joab is a he's a conniving individual. And I think what we're beginning to see in the character of Joab is going to come into play next week in our study about David with Uriah. So just keep that in mind. The character of Joab is really starting to be manifested to us here in chapter three. But yet when David hears that Abner has been murdered or been killed, what is David? How does David react? He, he, he says, okay, I'm innocent because once again, David is understanding the political things that's going on right now. He knows the power that Abner has in the north. David says, I am innocent of his death. But then David also laments. He, he cries out for Abner. The people see this and they're already, David's growing in the sights of the Lord. Well, then chapter four occurs. And in chapter four, we go from Abner to Ishbosheth. Now, what happens to this individual? He's essentially, he is asleep on his own bed and these wicked men come in and cut his head off. And that's pretty gruesome and that is a horrible way to meet your enemy. I mean, you're, you're asleep in your own house. You're the king in the capital. You would think that you would be safe. But here these wicked men come in and cut off the head of Ishbosheth. Now, they take the head to who? David. What, what story does this remind us of? Chapter 1, the Amalekite comes to David and says, I killed Saul, and here's his, here's his regalia. Here's the kingly things. How did David respond to the Amalekite there in chapter 1? <coughs> Your life is now going to be taken from you. These wicked men bring the head of Ishbosheth to David. How does David receive the head? Tells his young men to do what? <clears throat> Kill them and cut off their hands and feet and then hung their bodies upon the walls. Curse them. David, once again, he, he does things that are unique in the sense that here, these are his enemies. Saul was his enemy. Abner was the commander of the armies that were his enemy. Ishbosheth was a king that was taking something from David, which was rightfully David's. But in every one of these accounts, how does David respond to when his enemies die? Remorse. He suffers with them. He, he shows love even toward his enemies. And that kind of goes back to our application last week. So then in chapter 5, we come to chapter 5, Someone read for us chapter 5, the first two verses. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David and Ephraim and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. All right, so Ishmael said this died. Now all the people of Ishbosheth's kingdom, they all come to Hebron and they say, okay, David, you're now going to be our king. But how did they talk about it? What language do they use there that is unique? You are, we, behold, we are your bone and your flesh. Why is that unique language? Adam was put in a deep sleep. God took from him a rib, fashioned into him a woman. He brought Eve to man, and the man said, Behold, the flesh of my flesh and the bone of my bones. What are the people of Israel saying about the relationship that they're to have with their king? He's one of them, and it's a, it's a marriage-type relationship between the people and the king. 
And then look at the imagery of, of the Hebrew poetry there in verse 2 when he says at the beginning, you will be the shepherd or you will shepherd my people of Israel. And then second, you will be a ruler or a prince over Israel. Prince and shepherd. And again, what have we noted about David? David was taken from what? We're going to look at this in chapter 7. David was taken from being the shepherd among the sheep to becoming the shepherd of who? Israel. God has always intended that his king of Israel, the king of his people, be a shepherd. Saul was a king like the other nations. <clears throat> David is going to be different than Saul. Well, then in verses 6 through 10, we have David finally he comes. And why do you think David wants to take Jerusalem? All right. What do you see there in the text that tells us something about this city that David can understand from being a warrior? It's a it's a stronghold. It's immediately talked to or, or described as the city of David. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion. So David is looking at this as an opportunity. This is a place that I can build my capital and I can shore it up. I've got a valley on two sides that meets down here, the Kidron Valley. And then behind me, we're going to build, you know, up there on the top of the mountain. So we're going to have the high point. So whenever the enemies come against us, we're going to know where they're coming from. The high point usually wins in battle, right? David understood that as a war. And when he's looking around his kingdom, he says, this is the spot. This is where I want to be. Now, look at this map. And something that is stated here, you remember it talks about uh, the, the water pipes. Does it say it in here or is, it, or is that in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 11? Verse 8 says water shaft. Okay, the water shaft. The water shaft. So essentially it's probably one of the springs outside the city that comes up out of the earth. And there are caves underneath Jerusalem. And you can actually, they can they went down in this, and apparently Joab was one of those that went down through this cavern and made his way through and up into the city that enabled David to ultimately overthrow the Jebusites. Now, what's the first time we're introduced to the city of Jerusalem in the Bible? Like, this is not Bible Jeopardy, but it is. It's fun. Melchizedek. Oh, somebody said it. Who said that? Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek was the king of Salem. That's the first mention of Jerusalem. This, that's what's ultimately going to become Jerusalem. Now, also here, you see the top of Mount Moriah. Now, why do we know anything about the mountain or the mountains or mountain of Moriah? It's where Abraham offered Isaac. And by Jewish legend, and, and I believe by the Bible, where are they going to ultimately build the temple? Mount Moriah, right there at Jerusalem. So David knows all of these things. God is, is, is doing all of this. He's bringing it all together here. In chapter 5, David now has his capital in Jerusalem. Was there anything else that y'all saw in those early chapters that we may have overlooked? All right. I probably took entirely too much time there. This may be the one question that I looked at it and I was like, why did I even ask this question? Because this may be the, the easiest question in, in the whole world. Who sent cedar trees and carpenters and stonemasons to David? Hiram, the king of... Why did I even ask that? <clears throat> Alright, it's where the good trees were. Anybody? The, the only other thought I can have is who is the one that's going to send the same things to Solomon in the building of the temple? Hiram, the king of Tyre. 
And the only thing I can think of is I possibly thought that, you know, and it very well, these, this could be the same man, or it could be in a similar fashion as like Abimelech is back in the days of, of uh, Genesis with Abraham and then Isaac. Genesis chapter 20, Abraham lies to Abimelech that Sarah is wife. Genesis chapter 26, Isaac lies to Abimelech about uh, Rebekah his wife. Those are not the same Abimelechs, but it seems to be a name that's just given to the next king. Hiram may be the same thing. Or what you have here is something that happens later in David's reign. So him building his palace is not something that while chronologically we're still at, the, it seems to be at the beginning of David's reign, this could be something that is much later and, and toward the end of his reign, which that's a possibility too. That was one of those questions that I really, once I looked at it and tried to answer it myself, I was like, that was just a bad question. I was in a young man, mm -hmm. David became king at the age of 30, and he reigned for 40 years. And then it was in the fourth year of Solomon that he began to build the temple. Mm -hmm. So he could have still been alive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it very well could be the same individual. <coughs> no doubt about that. All right. Now let's look at chapter 6. But before we come to chapter 6 again, I want us to look at a map. It helps us to understand where we're at. So Beth Shemesh is where the Philistines had sent the ox cart. And remember, the ox cart carried what? Going all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 6. The ark. Now the ark did not stay at Beth Shemesh because why? 50,000 men died because they looked inside it. So the men of Beth Shemesh, or the people of Beth Shemesh, said to Kiriath Jerom, you got to come get this. And so they send it here, and then Kiriath Jerom is only about nine miles from Jerusalem. But now David lives in Jerusalem, and as he's living in Jerusalem, he says, okay, now it's time. I need to start. This is going to be my political center. This is also going to be our religious center. This is where God is going to be. So he's going to go get the ark and bring it to Jerusalem. So when we look at chapter 6, let's just do this step by step. The first five verses. You know, David has some good thoughts in chapter 6, and he has some good thoughts in chapter 7. But what does David do here in those first five verses that we immediately take note of and go, no, David, you shouldn't have done that? All right, transporting the ark on the what? On the cart. Now, why did David transport it on the ark, or the ark on the cart? All right, may have left it there, or it's just, well, that's how it came to us back then, so we'll, just, we'll do it the same way. Absolutely. So it just, well, I mean, that's how the Philistines sent it back. So that has to be the way that God's authorized it, right? Yes, ma'am. You notice um, in chapter one, David talked to God first before he did it. Should I go mm -hmm. to Judea? And the Philistines came, should I go out against the Philistines? So they came back, should I go out? But in this instance, you did not talk to God and say, should I go through the ark? Absolutely. And I think that's a good point to make out of chapter six and seven. And, and we're, I'm going to be there in chapter 7 in just a minute. So David says, well, we'll just transport it seemingly the same way the Philistines did. Well, that's your first mistake. Don't look to the Philistines to how the Israelites are supposed to carry something. So ultimately what happens, they come to the, the threshing floor of Nacon. It totters. Uzzah reaches out. Why did God strike us a dead? All right, I'm still waiting on it. Look at verse 7. There it is. There it is. Irreverence. What's the first thing Moses says to Aaron? And what's the first thing that the Lord says to Moses at the death of Nadab and Abihu? 
I am the Lord God. <clears throat> well, I am the Lord thy God. I am holy, and those who come to me will what? Will keep me holy. Now Uzzah had spent the past forty something years with what being in his house? The ark. Uzzah was one of the sons. He he's he was born and raised in the house that the ark has been since 1 Samuel chapter 6. Is it possible? Just listen to me, and, and I, please understand, this is me. Is it possible that Uzzah had begun to look at the ark as just another piece of furniture and not the ark of the most holy God of heaven? So when Uzzah saw the ark tottering, he just goes, well, he doesn't think anything about it. And he touched him. And God struck him dead for his irreverence. I will be treated holy by those who are coming to me. All right. Now, how did David react? He got angry. Who did David get angry with? Ooh, we. <coughs> now. Do you ever find yourself in David's shoes there? I think, I mean, let's be honest, brethren. Let's be honest. When you've lost somebody, when you've been diagnosed, when something happens in your life, we can react just like David. Now, David is going to teach us how to, to recover from that because I think David's going to do something here. Now, what does David do? And this may be getting a little bit more into the, the application for you. Let's, just, let's not talk about the application, but what does David apparently do three months later when he brings the ark the rest of the way into Jerusalem? He carries it, he carries it properly. Now, if you go back and, and look at the, and I'll give you these cross-references if you don't have these cross-references written down. The first is Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 22. That's the pattern that Moses was given to the construction of the ark. And the thing about the pattern that I want you to pay attention to in Exodus chapter 25 is that God instructed that poles were being inserted into the, to carry the ark, and those poles were not to be taken out. So again, if these poles had not been taken out, here they're carrying, they put the ark on a cart, and the ark itself has the poles to carry it with. So that, that's something that they should have seen. And then if you go over to Numbers chapter 3, verses 27 through 32, in a further explanation in Numbers chapter 4, verses 5 through 14, it talks about the Kohathites, who were the tribe of the Levites, or the family of the Levites, that were to carry the utensils of the, of the tabernacle. But one of the things, that, and I went back and I read this, when they were getting ready to move camp and move the ark, what were they to lay over the top of the ark? It's to be covered. The veil was to be taken down and placed over the ark, and then a porpoise skin was to be placed over that. So even when they carried it, and, and let's just go back, because I want you to see this one specific verse. Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4 and look at verse 15, very specifically. Numbers 4 and verse 15. Whoever gets there first. And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary, and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them but they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. These are the things in the tabernacle of meeting with the sons of Kohath. Just imagine if David would have read Numbers chapter 4 before he moved the ark of Kiriath Jericho. Uzzah would not have touched the holy thing of God and died. That, that's, that was the consequence. 
All right. So let's think about. Well, before we get to the application, there's one other thing that happens in chapter six that I want us to pay attention to very quickly. Chapter three, David called for who to see Abner, you will not see my face unless you bring me who? Michael. Chapter six, she's reintroduced to the story, right? What does Michael see in verse 16? All right, Michael sees David dancing. And I want you to pay close attention to verse 16. Michael, the daughter of Saul, not the wife of David, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David, not her husband, but King David, leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. There's a lot of things that's just happened. And I really, I try to emphasize to you back when, when Saul, you know, when Saul began to turn against David, how did he talk about David? David was no longer David. He was what? Son of Jesse. This relationship between Michael and David, who's the first and only woman of the Old Testament that says the woman loves the man? You remember? Michael. Michael loved David. That love is gone by this point in time. And then Michael comes to David in verse 20. She says, how does the king of, of Israel distinguish himself today? He uncovered himself today in the, in the eyes of his servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. Now, she comes after him. And, and she says some things, and I'll just be honest, brethren, it, it's hard for me to understand everything that's happening here. David's wearing what when he's doing all of this? A linen, a linen ephod. Again, the linen ephod is, it attaches David to what type of an individual? A priest. So there's, there's that attachment of the linen ephod. We've talked about the emphasis of garments throughout this, this narrative. Well, she says all that. Well, how does David respond to you? Who was he dancing before? You say I'm dancing before the, the servant maids. I'm dancing before the Lord. So first, he says, you need to check what you're saying to me. And then David, I think, really just takes the knife and stabs her. He says, you need to remember your place. And what's her place? The Lord has chosen me, not your father's household. The Lord has chosen me. Now, that seems, and then when you look at verse 23, she lives the remainder of her days without child. David is, it, it's hard for me to see some of these things and, and think of a, David and, and this is harsh. Now, she was due the rebuke because David was not just dancing provocatively. Or anything. David was dancing before the Lord. He was giving worship and praise to the Lord. The, the momentum of what was occurring that day in Jerusalem, that was a celebration, a time of praise and worship. And she's coming in and just trying to ruin it all. And David calls her to check, you know, you need to stop and, and check up. But I tell you that when David just comes after her in verse 22, that's hard. And it, it is. It's just hard. All right. Let's talk very quickly about application. What's some applications y'all have from the transporting of the ark? Specific authority. All right. Specific authority. All right, if it's been revealed, you need to be obeying what has been revealed. And I tell you, I, I think one of the greatest things, what's the, one of the greatest things for me here is how important is it for us to read the New Testament and to read everything that we've been given in the New Testament? Pretty important, right? Because if we were to overlook, ignore, 
or push to a side something that is commanded or something that is not authorized, and we do that, what can be our penalty? Same as us. Same as us. I wish you could say that in every building that's meeting right now. And that leads into chapter 7. And that, and exactly, that is a perfect segue to chapter 7. Just because your intentions may be seemingly justified in a human sense. I think we talked about that earlier. Somebody over here made that kind of comment. Doesn't mean that God has authorized that. Absolutely. Very good point. Colby, another point. We, don't, we need to be careful about using logic and trying to rationalize away God's command. Because we can put ourselves in Uzzah's position mm -hmm. and say, well, Uzzah was just trying to do something good, right? Mm -hmm. um, to protect the ark, but he still violated God's command. Absolutely. Absolutely. The only other point I had is when we think about the holiness of God, how will we respond and how will we be dealt with with God? Will we be on the side that Nadab and Abihu and Uzzah were dealt with or will we be like Isaiah? Remember when Isaiah was brought before the throne seat of God? How did Isaiah respond to the holiness of God? Behold, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips. How did Peter respond to Jesus being in the boat when he said to let down your nets one more time? And he saw the great quantity of fish there in Luke chapter 5. It says Peter fell on his face in the boat and said, get away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Now, are we going to respond with an irreverent attitude or are we going to respond with a reverent attitude? That's the only other application I have. Any others out of chapter 6? All right, let's move to chapter 7. When we come into chapter 7, we're really looking at the first three verses. What did David want to build for the Lord? All right, I want to build the Lord a temple. You know, what's funny about this, about David's attitude here in, in first, or 2 Samuel 7, verse 2? He's sitting in his own house. All right, he's sitting in his house. And he's thinking about God. But if we fast forward in Israel history to when they come back from Babylonian captivity, the people were sitting in their panel houses not thinking about what? About the temple. Hey, God, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 specifically. Here you labor, or you sit in your panel houses. So again, if we were to look at those two passages, we say that David and 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 2. Would we all agree that David has a great idea here? Well, he's, he's got, okay, we're going to get to that. And, and it's so good of an idea that when he goes to Nathan, this is the first time that we're introduced to the prophet Nathan. Nathan even says what? The Lord is with you. That's, that's surprising to me. Nathan didn't inquire of God either. That's interesting. And, and, but let's think about it from because that, I thought about that earlier today. I, I started. I said, you know, why did Nathan respond this way? You go back to chapter five, look at verse ten. Chapter five and verse ten. David became greater and greater for the Lord God of hosts was with him. So if Nathan is, is, is already with David by this time, it's just an automatic. I mean, you think about David. David, when he fought against the, the bear and the lion, who delivered him? When he fought against Goliath, who delivered him? 
when he was running from Saul and, and had the opportunities to take Saul's life, who still was with David? So when David comes to Nathan and says this, Nathan looks at all of the things and he goes, well, you know, that checks the box. David said, you know, David, if this is what you want to do, do it. How did the Lord respond? All right, David. Well, let's, let's just step through what... It, it, they, they are getting too quick with those bells or air signs. The first thing he says is, have I said anything? I haven't said anything, so if I haven't said it, then what? What did we learn about? <laughs> if God hasn't said it, if God hasn't said it, it's not authorized. It has to be revealed. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing, God understands the relationship that he has with his servant David. And because he has a special relationship with David, he doesn't just tell David no, but what does he do? He extends David a promise. <laughs> In verse 10, I, yes, absolutely. It, it, that's, he's saying, okay, David, I've not brought you in on this yet, but realize I, I, I know what you do. Because remember, David's after God's own heart. That's what he's wanting. He's wanting to do this for the Lord. So he tells David, no. But then he says, I will make your, you a house. I will build you a house. Now, when God says to David he's going to build him a house, he's using house in two, two terms. A house that's going to be your kingdom. And what does God say about David's kingdom? It's going to be forever. This is kind of getting into this next question. The covenant that God's going to make with David. So I'm going to build you a house, and that house is going to be perpetual. It's going to be forever. You, your throne is going to be forever. Now, will somebody sit on the throne of David today in Jerusalem? No, because who sits on David's throne and where is that throne now? It's in heaven. And who sits on that throne now? Jesus himself. Jesus sits on the throne of David now. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord rules. Okay, so that's fulfilled. But then that second, your house, your progeny, your Son is going to do what? He is going to build me a house. So David, I'm not going to allow you to build me a house. But your son, he will build me a house. Now if we turned over to 1 Chronicles chapter 22, what does David say that gives us another indication of why God withheld from him the right to build his house? Somebody said it. He's a man of war. You've shed much blood. And because of the blood that David has shed, God says, this isn't for you, David. But understand, I'm going to give your kingdom a peace. I'm going to give them prosperity. And in that time of peace, then your son will be the one who builds me the, the temple. All right. Let's it seems to be. It seems to be. And I and I didn't even talk about his sons in the different list that we have. <clears throat> but I don't want to overlook this. How did David respond to God's covenant? All right, a beautiful prayer. But how did he respond? What type of attitude? Gratitude. Oh, gratitude, yes. Humility. Humility. I think that's the key. You think about David in contrast to Saul. Now, we're still on the upward climb. Now, we're getting toward the top already because David's fall is coming. And we're going to start that next week. But David is still humble, and if you're humble, you go back to Hannah's prayer. You go back to the biblical principle. 
Those who are humble, God will exalt. And that's exactly what God's doing for David here. David's humility toward the Lord, the greatness of God, and then David calls on the Lord to fulfill the promises. David calls for the Lord to, to do what you said you were going to do. And of course, the Lord is going to do that. Any other thoughts, any other points in chapter 7? <coughs> You could almost look at that as the religious world today. If the person who said to you in church, listen to the preacher, it almost sounds too good to be true. It's got to be of God. If you don't go back and see what is written, or therefore you, you haven't looked at what God said, you can easily overlook it and uh, eventually lead to you being those of them. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, if you go back to uh, the first mentions of the sons of David, this is in chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. Uh, take note that Ammon, uh, Absalom, and Adonijah, all three of those were, those were wicked guys. And, and then I was going to say something about Solomon and Nathan being mentioned. They were brothers born both with Bathsheba and David. And they're both in the lineage of Christ. Any other thoughts? I appreciate so much your kind attention tonight in the discussion we have. Good to see everybody out tonight. Our first song will be number 127 in the hymns for worship. This is My Father's World, number 127. <clears throat>
Song of Invitation will be number 315. Just a few moments, we'll be singing number 315, the song of invitation for those who need to respond tonight to the gospel invitation. Before we do, I have just a few things I'd like to share with you, or a couple of things in particular. But I don't know if you've ever had uh, something similar happen to you as happened to me back, I guess it was in the month of February. Katie, we we have an annual thing at, uh, at the bank that it's called the Road Show. Do you remember that? And every year they get everybody together to kind of go back over the past year and what they're projecting out for the, the you know, coming years. A short-term plan and a long-term plan. You know, if, if, you, if you're engaged in a business, you, you have something very similar to that. But this is the first one we'd had in three years because of COVID, so we hadn't seen a lot of folks in a long time. And one of the ladies I worked with in Athens several years ago before I retired, she spotted me in that room and she came over to talk to me, but then she abruptly stopped as I was approaching her and she said, she said don't come any closer. And about the time she said that, I, I caught a whiff of what she was talking about. How many of you have ever had a skunk spray you? Has that ever happened to you? Well, one had got up under her house the night before and sprayed all up under it. It got all in her clothes, all in her house. And, you know, we had they had to leave from Athens at 8 o'clock in the morning or earlier, so she didn't have time to do much. So she put on as much perfume as she could stand. And I tell you what, perfume and skunk spell do not go well together. And I've had something very similar to that to happen to me. I ran over a skunk coming back from River Bend one night, and that thing was tumbling underneath, and I said, this ain't going to be good. And sure enough, as he was tumbling, I'm sure he was spraying because it took me two months to get that smell out of my car. Now, why do I say that? Because we, we have certain odors that are just distasteful to you, and it's actually just a stench, right? One of the worst smells, and probably the worst, is the smell of death. Would y'all agree with that? Something that's dead. Now, I've never experienced this, and I hope I never do, but I've heard people say that the worst is a, a rotting human corpse is the worst smell. It's just stench. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to, to Romans, the sixth chapter, and verse 23. Very short verse, a very powerful verse, and one that no doubt you know. But he says, the wages of sin is death, a spiritual death. And the Bible depicts in several occasions in the Old Testament that sin is an abomination to the Lord. He hates sin. In fact, in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, it's so bad that he turns his faith away from you. And what's the first thing that I did that morning when that lady approached me? I almost turned my head because the smell was so bad. Would you agree that, that sin is a stench to God? Yes. And the Bible tells us in Romans 3 and verse 23 that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of us at one time or another, and may still be the case, that we are a foul odor to the Lord. But now that's the, that's the bad part of Romans 6 and verse 23. Look at the rest of the verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You want to know how to get rid of the stench of sin? Well, the Bible has the answer for that. If you will, turn your Bibles back to Acts, the 22nd chapter. And in verse 16, and this is the Apostle Paul, and he was known by Saul at this time. And the Lord had appeared to him in Acts 9, as it recorded for us, on the road to Damascus. And he's recounted that in this in this chapter, he does so again in chapter 26 before King Agrippa. But he tells a story how the Lord appeared to him, and, and he was told in Acts 9 to go into the city, and there would be told what he must do. 
the preacher Ananias came to him and he said, Now where tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now I don't know what the remedy to skunk smell is to get rid of it. If you've got some ideas, please share it with me because we got them behind our house now and sometimes you can smell them. But the remedy for the stench of sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. If you'll turn to Revelation 1 in verse 5, when he was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, why does a person need to be baptized? Because from Jesus Christ in Revelation 1 in verse 5, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You know what the remedy for the stench of sin is? Is the blood of Jesus Christ. You've never obeyed the gospel. You're nothing but a stench but to God until you come in contact with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are a child of God and you're now living in sin, I want you to notice what the Bible instructs us to do to get rid of the stench of sin in that case. Open your Bibles to 1 John, the first chapter. Beginning in verse 5. John is writing to those who are Christians. This then is the message which we have heard of him, declaring to you that God is light and in him is no darkness is all. There is no sin before God. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. What removes the stench of sin if you sin as a child of God? The blood of Christ. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And He continues in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do you get rid of the stench of sin? If you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to do that tonight to remove that foul order from the nostrils of God. And if you're an erring child of God and you're living in sin before Him at this time, the remedy is still the same. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, but it's God's second law of pardon, that is confession and repentance and prayer. And God has promised He'll forgive you, and that odor will be removed. How powerful is the blood of Jesus Christ? Won't you come tonight as we stand and sing the song of invitation?
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for this gorgeous day that you've given us, for the sunshine and for the warmth. And Father, we thank you for all the blessings around us. We thank you for the blessing of the church and for this congregation that we're able to meet together to study more of your word and sing songs of praise to your holy name. Father, we thank you especially for your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. We might have a chance to be with you in heaven one day. Father, we pray that you'll be with those of our number and those that we know of who are sick and those who are suffering from cancer. And we thank you for the good reports that we've had on, on those who are, who are fighting off cancer. And Father, we ask that you'll be with those who are still suffering from the loss of loved ones. I ask that you'll be with those who are traveling and those who will be traveling and keep them safe as, as, they're, as they're gone. Father, we ask that you'll continue to watch over us. And we thank you so much for, for our elders, for the leadership, for the deacons, and for Brother Colby and Brother Frank, for the, the love of your word and, and the spreading of your gospel. We pray that we'll continue to grow spiritually as well as numerically. I ask that you'll continue to watch over us in all things. And please forgive us when we sin against you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.